Good morning, saints. Happy Sabbath. Beautiful fall Sabbath day, isn't it? God is so good. We've really enjoyed the changing of the leaves. You know, after 50-some years in Arizona, I come here and I didn't realize. You know, we'd see pictures out there of it. But when you can go out and see it in person, it is really, really something else, right? It is something that only God could do this every year. And every year it's a little bit different, at least it seems to me in the short time that I've seen it. Sometimes it'll be just brilliant and other times it's a little subdued. I want to uh, welcome all those who are watching on uh, online. Uh, there are some who watch online who are actually members of our church here, and we sure welcome you. One of these days, we'll all get to worship together, won't we? Amen. Praise God. I'm waiting for that day. I'm waiting for that supper where we sit down in the long table and Christ girds, puts his apron on and waits on us. Can you imagine the king of heaven doing that? But look how he washed the feet of the disciples in an example to us. So... You know, when, and getting here to my sermon today, my message, I don't like to call it a sermon, but it's a message that I think the Lord gave me. I never realized until yesterday evening what Monday is. Oh, yes, what day is Monday? Protestant Reformation Day. The world says, well, this is Halloween. And we hear about people saying, well, the Reformation, that's over now. Amen. They're all coming together. And I will get into this later on in my, in my message this morning. But uh, what a day. 505 years ago, Monday, Martin Luther is... Kim brought out, nailed the 95 Theses to the church, the door of the church there at Wittenberg, Germany. And yes, there was, even a hundred years before, there were people who were suffering and dying and trying to bring out the fallacy that had come into the church. Amen. But what Martin Luther did was really brought in the, what we think of as the start of the Reformation that I believe is still alive and well today. Okay, let's get into our message here a little more. How many have ever heard of the Pep Boys, the Pep Boys stores? Most of, uh, most of the men <laughs> raise their hands. They have something like four or 500 of them around the country. Uh, when I was growing up out there in California, why, uh, if you needed something, parts store, you went to Pep Boys. You know? uh, most men have heard of Pep Boys. But how many remember or have heard of the Three Stooges? Yeah, the Pet Boys, it was Manny Moe and Jack, and the Three Stooges, there was uh, Larry, Moe, and Curly, something like that. Curly and what? Curly Joe. Curly Joe, okay, thank you, Bob. <laughs> well, I'm gonna introduce you to the Mayhem Boys this morning. And with Mike's backdrop here, and the picture I'm going to show you, why we're going to have a whole herd of, or what do you call it, a herd of frogs? 
Well, turn with me to uh, Revelation 16. There we go. Revelation 16 and verse 13. <clears throat> when you get to that, wise, let's turn in your Bibles or your phone or whatever you have. I know it's on the screen, but um, this is something, and my wife is the one that actually brought this to my attention a couple of years ago. I believe this was, she probably will get mad at me for, this was something that she was shown to her in a dream. And I think God was trying to bring something to her attention. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. Wow, here we go. Here is three more frogs here. And I thank Sean for his excellent work here. Here is exposed the satanic trinity. This is in Revelation 16, 13 there. And out of their mouths came three unclean spirits that we call the mayhem boys. What is the meaning of mayhem? It is needless or willful damage or violence. When we're sick, where do we go? We go to the hospital, right? When we're spiritually sick, which we all are because we live in a fallen, dying world, sinful world, where do we go as followers of Christ? We come here to church. And even those of you who are watching on, uh, online or on TV, I remember during COVID, I thought it was wonderful when we had the live streaming that we could have church. Those of you who are still using it, God bless you. Amen. You are just as much a part of the family of God as us, those of us sitting here. So we go to church, we listen, we study, and we pray. So let's pray. Once again, Lord Jesus, we come to you. Lord, I'm begging for your Holy Spirit to anoint my lips this morning. Some of the things I have to say are not very pleasant. But Lord, I feel they must be said. And I pray that through your Holy Spirit, I will do it in such a way that it is of a blessing to your cause. Not to put anybody down, Lord. Not to bash anybody, but to lift up your gospel for this end time. Amen. Oh Lord, we need we need an outpouring of your spirit like never before. I pray for this. We thank you. We praise you. In your precious name. Amen. amen. So why is the name mayhem? <clears throat> why does it apply in this particular instance because Satan will do anything he can to distract us he will cause all kinds of mayhem yea every kind of mayhem that you can think of and some things that you have probably never entered your mind anything that he can come up with to distract us from the path that the Lord has laid out for us in other words, he has come to kill, steal, and destroy. 
The Mayhem boys enjoy this. That is why they have these evil, evil grins on their faces here. And I thank you, Sean, for the perfect way that he did this. This is a hospital corridor, right? And they're raising mayhem, living up to their names. If you study it, you will see that in the detail, and I never mentioned this to Sean when he was, when we were describing how to go about this. You look at that floor. You've probably seen that in hospital floors or so. But that is also a Freemason design there, black and white. There's... Satan wants nothing more than to destroy as many people as he can. He, to take as many people from the Lord's kingdom as he can drag away. So what are some of the evil things that he will use to accomplish this? Turn with me to uh, Revelation 16. Go down to verse 14 there. For they are spirits of devils working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Folks, we are in a war right now, a cosmic war like nothing this world has ever known. And it's going to come out in the open more and more as time progresses. And we're seeing things even today that are pointing towards the very end time through the scriptures, through the spirit of prophecy. And folks, I firmly believe in the spirit of prophecy. I'm going to tell you something, and this wasn't really in my message. When I was a little kid, I was in, what, the fifth and sixth grade in Pomona, California. My grandparents, my granddad had gone to work for the Southern California Conference, and they had a big uh, ranch that had been willed to them there in the Pomona area. Now you would, it's all houses and cities and everything. But anyway, he came off the farm and he was working there on a farm for the conference. I was going to school there at Pomona. And it had been a school. And my teacher in the fifth and sixth grade was a lady named Grace Jacques. <clears throat> and if some of you have watched uh, Keeper of the Flame on 3ABN, there was one episode where they uh, showed up at Elmshaven, which was Ellen White's last home up there in Northern California, beautiful area there. But they did a tour through her home there at Elmshaven, and the lady who did the tour there was Grace Jacques. She was Sister White's granddaughter she was born in Australia in 1900 when they left Australia and came back to the States. And she spent many years living there with her grandma, her dad, Willie White. This was his second marriage. And, but he was going traveling for uh, the church quite a bit. And she spent a lot of time there with her grandma. And she told us stories about sometimes getting up at night and she would hear her grandma praying. She'd see the light under the door from her grandma's bedroom. She would hear her talking to Jesus. Amen. And she told us other stories that just, it just, 
welded into my mind. And then when I've had the privilege myself of reading the things, and my mother, at, when I was four and five years old, read, I remember the first vision out of early writings. And she read stuff to me out of great controversy. And this, folks, I'm a firm believer. I think of, uh, many times I think of Christ's prayer of uh, John 17, the last part of his prayer, where he was praying for us. Jesus, said there in the Garden of Gethsemane, he was praying for us. He said, I pray for those who are reading about, reading the words of those who see all of this, that's happening at the crucifixion, at the ministry of Christ. And, those, and they were going to write words. And Christ was praying for those who would read it. That's us, Lord. I compare that too. Now, I'm not saying that Ellen White was an apostle or anything, but I think she was definitely, I'm a firm believer that she was definitely inspired. And I'll bring out some things that, that I believe ratify that a little more later on in my talk. Okay, getting back to the message here. Satan is pulling out all the stops. He's going to use every trick that he has available. Everything that he can think of because this is his last go round. This is his last chance. We're down to the end of time, folks. Jesus is going to come soon, right? When you watch the signs of things happening in the world, you see that it is, it can't help but be drawing closer. He's going to have to come pretty soon or this earth is going to be destroyed. Fearful sights. This is a message out of Great Controversy, a book that Ellen White said more than anything else, the, this book needs to be gone to the world. And we have said that in our last general conference sessions. This message was brought out in 2015, the one we just had in St. Louis. But what are we doing is this great controversy being handed out daily by everybody? All, are, we, are we flooding the neighborhoods with this, with this book? Because it has an end time message. We've got people that, well, stand up and say that in the general conference and then two, three months later, what? If, well, we got some out there on the shelf. We ought to be out of them. Donald ought to be scrounging around trying to <laughs> dig up funds to buy some more. Enough of that. Let's read the message here. Fearful sights of a supernatural character will soon be revealed in the heavens in token of the power of miracle-working demons. The spirits of devils will go forth to the kings of the earth and to the whole world, just as we read in the scriptures, to fasten them to deception and urge them on to unite with Satan in his last struggle against the government of heaven. All oh, mercy. Remember, at one time, Satan, or as... Kim showed that picture of Lucifer. He was the highest created being in the universe. God couldn't have exalted him any higher. And yet he let this build in his heart. This desire for worship for himself. He was highly exalted already and the angels, they loved him. But he wanted to be actually above God. 
But anyway, we see that his that he has this struggle, this war, this great controversy, this cosmic warfare that is going on that is far more powerful than anything that we've been able to come up with. We as human beings. During Vietnam, I was hauling, I was in the trucking business, and I hauled the 155 howitzers from Colorado over to Oakland. You put them on ships and they'd take them to Vietnam. Some of you guys that were in Vietnam, you probably saw them. 155 howitzers, boy, they just lob a shell out there for miles. We've got the atomic bomb, the hydrogen bomb, all this nuclear warfare. If God would let us, we could probably destroy ourselves. He's not going to let that happen, though. But anyway, where I was going here is we see the unity, the coming together of the different religions now. This is part of Satan's plan for the end time. Getting all the religions. And I'm not talking about just the apostate Christian and the, and the churches of Rome. I'm talking about bringing together the Buddhists, the Hindus, and Islam, the Church of Islam, the Muslims are coming together. Next month there's going to be a conference in Egypt. I forget the name of the city. We heard about last year that COP26 and this year will be COP27 and they've got uh, can, uh, they've got buildings in Dubai representing Islam, Judaism, and they call it Christianity. But how can a work of the devil be called Christianity? If you're not worshiping Christ, that is that's blasphemy. Let's go on here. By these agencies, rulers and subjects will be alike deceived. And when you see these coming together, you see there is deception there, but they're, they got their eyes wide open, but they're being deceived. Persons will arise pretending to be Christ himself, and claiming the title and worship which belong to the world's Redeemer. And we know of that. Every once in a while we hear of somebody in Russia or the Philippines or somewhere that claims to be Christ, and they end up with millions of followers. I don't know what happens to the followers when all of a sudden that person claiming to be Christ, they up and die. Well... There'll come a time when Satan himself is going to come down, and this is going to be a, a happening that we are warned against. We're not to even think about it or look up on it on television or anything like that. Satan will appear only on the earth as an angel of light. A glory that we in our generation have never seen. Don't, out of curiosity, tune in to see it. Because Satan has, remember, he has, still has that power, a lot of the power that he was given as Lucifer. He didn't lose all that when he was thrown out of heaven. That's why we're counseled never to try to fight Satan with our own measly power. I don't care how strong you are spiritually, physically, temporally. It doesn't make any difference. They will perform wonderful miracles of healing and will profess to have revelations from heaven contradicting the testimony of the scriptures. 
You know, has God been faithful with his word? When Donna and I, we were in Israel, we saw there the caves where they had found the, what they called the Dead Sea Scrolls back in the, what was it, 47 or 48, something like that. The shepherds found them there. And in these caves, <clears throat> in these jars, there, there were these scrolls, and they were a couple thousand years old. Amen. And they were from the scriptures. And you know what they said? The same thing that's here. God takes care of his word. Amen. When you read something in the scriptures, now I'm talking about the King James or the New King James. I'm leery of anything. The NIV and some of these others, folks, we have to be careful Amen. because there's either stuff omitted or a word or two changed we want, but God has protected his word and kept it precious. It was good when it was written. Some of it 3,500 years ago, some of it 2,000 years ago. It still applies today. Revelation, which was written, what, probably A.D. 70, A.D. 90? was shown to John on the Isle of Patmos. Yes, it was symbolic. But God has made, between Daniel and Revelation, he's made this message clear to us. We have people in our own church that are saying, well, maybe it isn't exactly like that. When... Ellen White was shown things that go right along with the scriptures. She was so, shown things, and now they're saying, well, that was 100, 140 years ago. Most of the time when I read something out of the, the scriptures or out of the spirit of prophecy, I think, wow, was that written last week? You read some of these things and like the counseling and the testimonies or you see in, in uh, great controversy you see these things happening and how did she know these things? Because they're, see, they're coming true right now before our eyes day by day. Amen. Well God showed them to her in vision. And I'm not going to go into proving that she was actually in vision and didn't breathe for 30, 40, two hours at a time, but yet she was wide awake. It was proven. Anyway, now I lost my place here. I, yeah, the end of the scriptures here. I got a message here from a, I hope I'm pronouncing his name right. H.B. Sweet, the spelling's correct, but anyway, he describes the false prophets as persons who falsely interpret the mind of God. True religion has no worse enemies and Satan no better allies. When you have people that are taking the scriptures and twisting them around, or taking the spirit of prophecy and say, well, it doesn't really mean what she said here. Satan has no better allies than people that are talking like that. Now, folks, I'm not here to bash people. I'm here to, I, I'm, what I, my message today, what my burden today is to wake up some of the people to some of the things that are happening in our church, our remnant movement that we need to become aware of. People that are in high places in our institutions, 
or in our general conference or even in some of the churches. They're preaching things that 50 years ago they wouldn't have dared preach. And they have people believing it, unfortunately. True religion has no worse enemies and Satan no better allies. See, most of the time when we think of false prophets, we think of people in, in either the Church of Rome or in the apostate Christian churches, the first day churches out here. And they preach, you know, the state of the dead that does do, and that the commandment's been done away with, well, at least the fourth commandment. Nine are still working. <laughs> but we don't need to keep the fourth one. Things like that. But within when you have things happening in our own church by some very influential people, I pray for them. I'm not here to bash them or to run, run them down. <clears throat> I just want to make people aware of things that are either not being said right or being twisted around a little bit. What are some of the signs that we look for? What does this have to do with us as Seventh-day Adventists? I'm instructed to say, now I'm going to read, this is... This is all part of this quote that's on the screen, but I'm going to read. I didn't put it all on slides. The first part I'm just reading. I am instructed. This is from the uh, Spirit of Prophecy. I'm instructed to say that in the future, great watchfulness will be needed. There is to be among God's people no spiritual stupidity. Evil spirits are actively engaged in seeking to control the minds of human beings. Men are binding up in bundles, ready to be consumed by the fires of the last days. Those who discard Christ and his righteousness will accept the sophistry that is flooding the world. That's kind of an old school word there, sophistry, but that's like the, the doctrines, the beliefs that are being presented out there. It's flooding the world. Christ, or Christians are to be sober and vigilant, steadfastly resisting their adversary, the devil, who's going about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Boy, that sounds like, that's quotations right out of the scriptures. <clears throat> Pardon me. Satan always seems, seems to try to work on me <laughs> when, when I'm going to get up here. Boy, he works on my voice or something. We're going to ignore that. Men under the influence of evil spirits will work miracles. They will make people sick by casting their spell upon them and will then remove the spell, leading others to say that those who were sick have been miraculously healed. This Satan has done what? Seldom? No. Once in a while, again and again. There have been entire ministries raised up as healing ministries. We've seen, we've seen them. Universities have been formed out of these ministries. Television, television networks that have become full-time, 24-7 entities based on what was a so-called healing ministry that was not of the Lord. Now, how can I be sure that they were not of the Lord? Well, they're teaching doctrines that are diametrically opposed to what the Holy Scriptures are teaching. 
doctrines that came directly from paganism, idol worship, and teachings that originated from Satan himself. Well, some of them first taught where? In the Garden of Eden. Oh, boy. And this is where spiritualism first reared its ugly head. You will not surely die. We need not be deceived. Wonderful scenes with which Satan will be closely connected will soon take place. God's word declares that Satan will work miracles. He will make people sick. And then, as we said before, and then will suddenly remove their satanic, his satanic power. They will then be regarded as healed. These works of apparent healing will bring Seventh-day Adventists to the test. Many who have had great light will fail to walk in that light or the light because they have not become what? One with Christ. Folks, I could stand up here all day and I could have a message that, boy, just sounded wonderful. But if I am not going by the leading of the Lord, what is it worth? And actually, when people are, folks, I I spend time in prayer. I didn't spend time at the seminary. I I pray every time I get up here, it represents hours of prayer because I'm a sinful person that needs I need this message as much or more than anybody out there. I'll quit rambling on. But remember, folks, here's what I'm getting at, is walking in the light. We must stay in the light by daily connection with Christ and the Holy Scriptures through our devotion, through prayer, and study of the Scriptures. Folks, I'm telling you, if you don't have a daily devotion, you're shortchanging your relationship with God. And the time is going to come when our religious liberty is going to be taken away. And it's going to go back to just like it was in the dark ages. Now, we're not supposed, some people are saying we're not supposed to talk about this anymore. It's still, it's coming, folks. It's coming. I don't care what what some of these false teachers are saying out there. It's going to happen. We're told in the scriptures. We're told in great controversy. We're told in all of the works that she has on the end times. In a special sense... Seventh-day Adventists have been set in the world as watchmen and light bearers. So what is this saying? When you come into this remnant movement, this is saying that we have a special burden that is placed on us. Except I don't call it a burden. I call it a privilege. I thank the Lord that he gives me a chance to witness Every time I give a Bible study or talk to somebody about this gospel, I thank God for that opportunity, for the honor that has been placed on me by being able to witness for him. But in order to have this message, we have to study the word and we have to remain in close relationship with Jesus through prayer and study. To them has been entrusted the library, the last warning for a perishing world. On them is shining wonderful light from the word of God. They have been given a work of the most solemn import 
the proclamation of the first, second, and third angels' messages. There is no other work of so great importance. Do you see, you, you see that, folks? There is no other work of so great importance. What is she talking about? The three angels' message. And yet we have people saying that we need to tone that down. Folks, we need, to, we need to be shouting it from the housetops. Lift it up. Thank you, Bob. There is another work so great of importance. They are to allow nothing else to absorb their attention. Now, folks, this was written over 100 years ago. Does it apply today? Is this old hat now? Boy, this doesn't sound like we should be embracing ecumenism or joining hands with other churches. I'm going to go back to Martin Luther here. He called the Pope Antichrist. Now, I told you I'm not here to bash people, but we t it talks about the Antichrist here. We have to warn people of that. Amen. That's part of the message to come out of her by people. If classical Protestantism is dead, as some people are trying to say, the Reformation is over. That ended. Thank you. Not in my house either, Bob. <laughs> Not in our church. By God's will, it's not in our church. Why did he raise up this remnant movement? To counteract that, as, as uh, Mr. Danny says. To counteract the counterfeit. I like that. Once I thought, boy, does he get tired of saying that? And then I thought, praise God he doesn't. Amen. Praise God he continues to say that. Counteract the counterfeit. If classical Protestantism is dead and if there are no more reasons to protest, why are we separated from Rome? If the reasons for leaving Babylon have been resolved, why are we still divided? We should all return home to the universal ecumenical brotherhood of Rome consisting of beliefs and gods known to man and to Satan. I don't want that. But if, Bible, if biblical prophecy is true, if there really is a sinister power described in Revelation 13, 17, uh, 18, that is planning global tyranny right now, then the protest is not over. God put prophetic warnings in his word. If they don't apply to Rome as Luther and other reformers believed, to whom do they apply? I had a chart somewhere. I don't know if it was in the back of, I think it was in the back of one of my study Bibles. It listed all the reformers. And their thoughts on the papacy and different things. And they were, every one of them, in agreement. A couple hundred years, of, this was a couple hundred years spread here, these different reformers. They were all of the same idea that the papacy is the Antichrist, the beast power. Where did the beast get its power? From the dragon. We got to bring people out of this. Through, the, well, through through the 
Holy Spirit. These are the words of God and are meant to be interpreted and proclaimed. The warnings will bring joy and salvation to those who receive them. If you're taking notes, put Revelation 15 too. I didn't get it on there. But, and pain and loss to those who don't believe. Revelation 14, 9 and 10, and we will have these on the, up there on the, oh boy, I got carried away. Here we go. Lost my place. These end time prophecies are not critical or hateful words lest we accuse God of these charges. You will see my explanation of what I mean by these charges in a few minutes. In the service of God, there is no middle ground, folks. This is out of our devotional we had the other morning in, uh, up there in Pastoral. Our High Calling, page 305, second paragraph. In the service of God, there is no middle ground. Let none expect to make a compromise with the world and yet enjoy the blessing of the Lord. If you're, if you're compromising your beliefs to be able to get along and maybe have a better position in your employer or employment or keep peace at home or something like, or whatever, if you're compromising your beliefs in order to accomplish that, You're headed in the wrong direction. Let none expect to make a compromise with the world and yet enjoy the blessing of the Lord. He can't bless you. He can save you from your sin. He can't save you in your sin. Let God's people come out from this world and be separate. Let us seek more earnestly to know and do the will of our Father in heaven. Yeah. Remember the daily devotional that we were talking about earlier. Let the light of truth which is shown upon us be so received that its bright rays may go forth from us to the world. Are we letting, are we, is Christ living in us is to such a degree that people see Christ reflected in us? That's what it's supposed to be. If they can't see Christ in us, how do they get the message? Are they going to believe things coming out of our mouth? If they don't see us living it, you know, what's the expression uh, uh, talking about to parents? Kids play, pay more attention to what they see than what they hear. Right? As parents, those of you who are parents, will you agree with me on that? Boy, if they see you doing one thing and saying something else, what are they going to believe? Same way with those that, well, let unbelievers see that the faith we hold makes us better men and women, that it is a living reality, sanctifying the character and transforming the life. Amen. When they can see that in us, then they will listen to what we have to say. Or even if we don't get a chance to say anything, they will have a tendency maybe to listen to somebody else that's bringing them the remnant message. Our characters will reflect Christ in such a way that others will be directed to the foot of the cross. Okay, we talked about Revelation 14, 9 and 10. Boy, what did I do? Not get, uh-oh. Sorry, I missed that one. But that's still out of uh, that. Well, I was going to back up there. 
Yeah, let the light of truth that has been shown. Okay, that's out of our high calling, 305.2, same as the other one. Okay, now let's go to the, the third angel's message. This is for our time. The first and second angel's message, it still applies now. But when, when did that first come into being? 1844, right? The judgment. We preach that. Why? People say, man, is that an excuse that you came up with so that to cover up your disappointment there in 1844? No, it's, it's happened. That was an actual event that happened. Christ walked from the holy to the most holy place, right? The judgment started. Anyway, now we go to the third angel. Then the third angel followed them saying with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or in his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God. And this is the sad part, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and the presence of the Lamb. We're going to, in a little bit, I'm going to talk about an agreement that was signed that we agreed and when I say we, as a Seventh-day Adventist movement, we agreed, at least one person, a high-up representative of our movement, agreed that we would not preach this second and third angel's message in the Central American area and Southern America. And the smoke of their torment ascends up forever and ever. And they have no rest day or night to worship the beast in his image and whoever receives the mark in his name. Now we come to the part about God's children. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they, those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. There is only one religious movement in this entire world that this is very simple. Keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus or faith in Jesus. You can say it either way or you can say it both ways. Give me the faith of Jesus and I want to have faith forever in Jesus. Amen. Amen. A little sidebar here. Have you ever wondered what the patience of the saints is? Well, I looked it up in the, uh, I believe it was in the SDA Bible Commentary. Steadfast endurance. I like that. You know, you think of patience. Well, give me patience to just sit here and wait. Wait for my turn at the, at the barber shop or at the doctor's office. Waiting for my wife to get ready. <laughs> no, my wife is. I love waiting on her. <laughs> <laughs> well, I like waiting on her. I'll say that. <laughs> I'll be honest. I love my wife, though. But anyway, it's steadfast endurance, folks. Is that a characteristic that you want to have Amen. we're going to go through some rough times the Lord promised us that but what else did he promise he said I'll go through them with you I'll never leave you or forsake you I'm going to be with you so we don't have to worry about that and he will never allow us to be tempted above what we are able through his strength and power 
to overcome. So do we have to wor- have anything to worry about? No. All you have to do is just stay close to Christ. The closer we stay to him, the less we have to worry about. Okay, get back to get back to our message here. As we are calling the papacy the beast and the image the beast, image of the beast, we are told that we need to quit using these expressions by some of the leaders of some of the religious departments in our church. We need to be more kind and condescending. We need to come together in an ecumenical way. This is not what the scriptures say. We're supposed to be encouraging people to come out of these false doctrines. By the way, if there's anyone who does not understand what ecumenical means, it means coming together and agreeing, joining with other churches, first day churches, apostate Protestant and Roman Catholicism, and joining in with them in a way that we can all get along. Folks, this is sad. This is sad. And here, once again, I'm not, now I have the name of the person that that I'm going to be talking about. I'm not gonna give the person's name. I'm asking you to trust that what I'm telling you is the truth. I'm not here to bash someone who has since passed away. But I'm here to warn us of what has happened and warn us against embracing it ourselves. In 1982, there was a conference in Lima, Peru, that I'm going to call the BEM conference. BEM stands for Baptism, Eucharist, and Ministry. The purpose being that we would agree and ignore our differences for the time being. All of the major so-called Christian religions were present, including a representative of the Seventh-day Adventists. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time explaining each portion of this BEM document except to say that we as Seventh-day Adventists should have had no part in this. The baptism section would include infant baptism and whatever any kind of baptism that whatever each church wanted. So if your church over here wants this kind of baptism, I heard of a man that actually baptized somebody with a bottle of Coca-Cola. What a, what a travesty. The Eucharist is a doctrine from the Roman Catholic Church that theoretically re-crucifies Christ with every Mass. It's bad enough when I read about the crucifixion of our Lord. I try to read that Matthew 27 there. I try to read that almost every morning. I didn't. Matthew 27, starting at verses about 24, I think, 27, up to 54. Doesn't hurt to read that every day. Remind us of what our Lord went through. But to imagine that they want to bring him down, and I'll go in, I better go on here. The ministry section, the M section of this document says that all the churches agree not to proselytize in another church. 
In other words, we don't invite them to come out of the darkness into light. We don't preach the second and third angel's message. We don't tell them that they're wrong. We don't tell them that they're that they're going to die in that faith. If it's a false faith. Now I'm glad that God's the judge. There's many people that have lived up to all the life that they had that never heard of the seventh day Sabbath. They just thought Sunday was the Sabbath. When you're not shown, when you're not allowed under the penalty of death to read this or especially to own a piece of it, God, and you you live up to whatever light you have, God takes care of that. The old King James says he winks at the ignorance. That isn't making a joke out of it, Lord, folks. That the Lord is being kind and, and he is realizing that if a person's living up to everything that they know or have had a chance to learn because you are held responsible for what you have an opportunity to learn but don't. Right? There was a professor from one of our universities. Okay, going back to this conference, this BEM conference. This professor from one of our universities was there representing the Seventh-day Adventist Church. He wasn't there just as a casual observer who signed this document in agreement. The only way we should have had someone there would be as an observer, as I've already said. Now... Let's go to the fourth angel of Revelation 18, which explains even more and in detail our mission. After these things, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was illuminated with his glory. And he cried mightily with a loud voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become a dwelling place of demons, a prison of every faithful spirit, and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. Now, folks, this is just is a reiteration of the third angel's message of Revelation 14, but it goes into more detail. You know, when God wants us to, when God wants us to have a message that is vitally important, he doesn't just give it once. Usually he doesn't just give it twice, but a lot of times two or three times. This is what he has done here. This is important. Come out of her. Babylon, who is Babylon? This is the false entities. This is the, this is the church of Rome. This is the apostate Christian churches that are following after her. And they say, oh, no, no, we don't follow Rome. Well, if you, and you don't want to argue with them, folks. But where did you get the day that you keep? Did you just make that up on your own? No, you study your church history. It came from the founders, came out of the Church of Rome. And the Church of Rome brags about, it brags about them being the founders of the first day worship. Oh yes, it represents the uh, celebrating the resurrection of Christ. Christ never asked us to have a special day to celebrate his resurrection. We have the, well, we have the, the communion service that celebrates this. But I'm going to get into some sad things on that. 
For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. And the merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. Is this happening today? Are they joining together? You see this. Islam and Rome are coming together. Judaism is represented in, over there at Dubai, they have the three temples that were built. Representing Islam, Judaism, and the false Christianity. I don't even like to use the word Christianity in connection with that. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins and you receive of her plagues. For her sins have reached to heaven and God has remembered her iniquities. God is finally going to call a halt to all this. And when he pours out the plagues, I, don't, I want to be under the shelter of Christ. We are told that we will not partake of them. Just as in Egypt now, everybody had the first three plagues, but the last seven, only the Egyptians. I won't go into that now. Can, but can it be any more clear than that? The fourth angel's message it spells it out there. We aren't supposed to preach that. We're supposed to keep it quiet. What a travesty. Oh, boy. Doesn't get any better yet. This is a Catholic ecumenical leader. He promotes the Eucharist Mass and communication with the dead in an Adventist church. Don Lorenzo Mazzarelli is a former Catholic priest who served at the Saint, Saint Pasquale Catholic Church on Via Rivoltella, Rivoltella in Trieste, Italy. He's now working with the Secretariat for Ecumenical Activities Group in Trieste. He's, he's still a Catholic. It's a regional interfaith organization that seeks Christian unity among the different religions in Italy. When Don Lorenzo Maggiarelli is not socializing with Cardinal Turkson, as shown here in this picture, the two pictures on your left there, the former perfect, this uh, cardinal is the former perfect, or prefect, pardon me, prefect of the Vatican's Dicastery for Promoting Integral Human Development. And he's now the Chancellor of the Pontifical Academies of Sciences, the schools right there in Rome that teach most of the Jesuit teachings. He is busy teaching Catholic doctrines. When he's not with the, when this Don Majorelli is not with him while he's busy teaching Catholic doctrine in Seventh-day Adventist churches. Folks, this is information that comes out of a website called the, the Advent Messenger. This isn't something I dreamed up. In May 11, 2022, the SAA group of Trieste announced through their official channels that Don Lorenzo Majorelli had visited the Seventh-day Adventist church of Trieste, uh, via Rugodi, and spoke about the communion of the saints, the dead saints, from a Catholic perspective. The SA group of Trieste also published a photo, this photo here of Don Lorenzo, speaking inside the Trieste Seventh-day Adventist Church, during his message, Don Lorenzo Maggiarelli reminded the Seventh-day reminded the Seventh-day Adventist congregation that it was the Eucharist 
that makes us part of the same church. Folks, that's a direct quote. That isn't my words. That isn't a a made-up message from the Advent Messenger. This is a direct quote from Don Lorenzo. Eucharist, it was the Eucharist that makes us part of the same church. Yes, we do celebrate communion. Let me go on here. Folks, I know it's getting late. On Monday, May 9, May 2022, at the Adventist Christian Church, he gave a conference on the theme, I Believe the Communion of Saints, the Catholic Perspective. Okay, it was organized by the ecumenical group. Okay, this is what ecumenism ecumenism and interfaith cooperation lead to. Catholic officials teaching Rome's doctrines in our churches. Next, Don Lorenzo Majorelli pushed the need for Eucharist unity with Rome. The SAE group of Trias continued in their news report. I'm going to read part of this. I didn't put it on the screen. But this is a quote here. The church, inasmuch as it is born of the Spirit, is a communion of saints who are thus called in the New Testament as sanctified by the Spirit. Yes, we believe in that. Saying, I believe the church, corresponds to saying that this mystical meeting is called by the Spirit. Now communion, in other words, they're... Theirs is called by the Spirit. Well, it's called by a Spirit, all right, but it's not from above. Now, communum sanctorium always means communion in holy things. In the Catholic Orthodox tradition, and albeit with less substantial weight in the Reformed tradition, it is... Oh, boy, what did I do? Get behind... It is the Eucharist that makes us part of the same church because we participate in one bread, the body and blood of Christ, having the meaning for the Catholic, substantial, and for this reason, after the Holy Supper, the bread remains the body of Christ and is kept in a reliquary. Am I saying that right? R-E-L-I-Q-U-A-R. It's a container that they keep the leftover bread. This is the body of Christ. He's clearly teaching that the bread becomes the actual body of Christ and must be kept in a reliquary, which is a special container to hold religious relics. He also told the Seventh-day Adventists that the... Holy Eucharist unites us into one church. This isn't a demonstration. This is a a meeting of instruction, it sounds to me like. Oh, God have mercy. In his book, The Faith of Millions, Roman Catholic priest John O'Brien explains the Catholic Mass. When the priest pronounces the tremendous words of consecration, he reaches up into the heavens, brings Christ down from his throne, and places him upon our altar to be offered up again as the victim for the sins of man. It is the power greater than that of monarchs and emperors. It is greater than that of saints and angels, greater than that of the seraphim and cherubim. Cherubim. Indeed, it is greater even than the power of the Virgin Mary. Now remember, this is a Catholic saying this. While the Blessed Virgin was the human agency by which the Christ became incarnate a single time, the priest brings Christ down from heaven now, this is the part. I didn't put all of this on there, but folks, it's, it's there. The priest brings Christ down from heaven and renders him present on our altar as the eternal victim for the sins of man. 
Not once, but a thousand times. The priest speaks, and lo, Christ, the eternal and omnipotent God, bows his head in humble obedience to the priest's command. My precious Lord who died on Calvary is going to bow to an apostate, blasphemous priest calling him down to a ceremony that is abominable. Oh. Rome's ecumenical message about Eucharist unity, communication with the dead, and pantheistic eco ecological conversion will lead to the mark of the beast. There are distractions designed to keep us from fulfilling our calling. You can be faithful to God without supporting these interfaith gatherings and Catholic indoctrination taking place in Italy and the other parts of the world. I'm going to, because of the hour, I've got some other things that, that need to be brought out. It, should I go on or not? All right. We have a life and death message. We must let it appear so. We must, it is the great power of God. We are, where am I at here? Oh boy. Okay. We are to present it in all its telling force. Then the Lord will make it effectual. It is our privilege to expect large things, even the demonstration of the Spirit of God. We know it's going to be poured out. The Holy Spirit's going to be poured out upon us. This is the power that will convict and convert their soul. The perils of the last days are upon us, and in our work we are to warn the people of the danger they are in. Let not the solemn seeds which prophecy has revealed be left untouched. If our people are, were half awake, if they realize the nearness of the events portrayed in the revelation, a reformation would be wrought in our churches. And many more would believe the message. This is not talking about just a reformation outside there. It's talking about in our churches. We have no time to lose. God calls upon us to watch for souls as they must give an account. Now I want to come a little closer to home. I want to speak to something that's coming into our church in a very subtle way. There, is a, there was a conference in Central California a while back where John Pauline was the keynote speaker. I'm not here to bash John Pauline. He's far more educated than I am. I don't have any letters after my name except the B.A. of born again. <laughs> he has a, co a couple of masters and a, a uh, doctorate, maybe one or two, or maybe two doctorates. I don't know. Anyway, he's a highly educated, and he has appeared on 3ABN. And I'm not here to, to put him down in any way. I just have a question with some of his sayings. He's the head of the Department of Religion at Loma Linda University. I'm a firm believer in the spirit of prophecy. I already told you that. I believe when Ellen White says she was shown something or told something in visions or night seasons, she was being directed by God. Okay, a quote from Dr. Pauline, Pauline that I'm going to refer to. He is referring to prophecies from great controversy. I'm a firm believer, oh. I'm a firm believer that we should not try to water down or change the meaning of Ellen White's writings. 
Some of our teachers and some of our colleges are saying that the spirit of prophecy is outdated, doesn't refer to our time. Pardon me, uh, probably time for me to be quiet, but Lord, this message is yours. You gave it to me, and I need to give it to the people. Our careful study of fulfilled prophecy. Okay, now this is a quote from Dr. Pauline. I didn't put it all on here. Okay, here we got it. Our careful study of fulfilled prophecy out of careful study from the books of Revelation and reading these statements from Ellen White with the biblical principles in mind, we should be careful not to assume that the end time will be identical to great controversy in every detail. Considering both the Bible and the world history, were Ellen White alive today, there is at least a chance that her depiction of the end would be different than it was in the 1880s. Now, he's not arguing with her. He's not saying she was wrong, but he's saying, well, if she was alive today, she wouldn't be saying these, possibly. He's placing doubt. Thank you, Bob. He's placing doubt where there shouldn't be any doubt. When she talks in the great controversy, I'm not saying it's the same as the scriptures, but I'll tell you it's right next to the scripture. It is more essential. Now this is from, I'm going to leave this other on there for a minute. It is more essential that I should devote myself to writing out the important matters of volume four. This is a, the Spirit of Prophecy, which was the original great controversy, volume four of that. That the warning must go where the living messenger could not go, that it would call the attention of many of the important events to occur in the closing scenes of this world's history needed by all who profess to believe in the present truth. As the condition of the church and the world was open before me, and I beheld the fearful scenes that lie just before us, I was alarmed at the outlook. And night after night, while all in the house were sleeping, well, I think sometimes Gracie was up watching. <laughs> I wrote out the things given to me of God. I was shown the heresies which are to arise, the delusions that will prevail, the miracle-working power of Satan, the false Christ that will appear, that will deceive the greater part even of the religious world. And that would, if it were possible, draw away even the elect. Is this work of the, and I didn't get this on the screen, but is this work of the Lord? I know that it is. And our people also profess to believe it. Now, I put down here Sister White. It's Ellen White, but we, we many, much, many times call her Sister White, and I'm, I'm going to use that. She had no personal views on the end of time. She simply wrote what God showed her in the Great Controversy book. Amen. And she saw it. Heresies in the churches, spiritualism, ecumenism. What were we just talking about? Is that outdated? Not when we see it coming to pass. Yes. False Christ, the beast in the image, the close of probation, the time of trouble, the second coming of Christ, the millennium and the final home of the faithful. According to Dr. Pauline, we would have to ignore everything that Ellen White wrote 
in the final chapters of the great controversy. I got one more slide here. This is out of that book, The Great Controversy, that she says is the one book of hers that should be put out to the whole world. If any book of hers should be put out, she says that is the one. Now I'm paraphrasing this, but that's what she meant. And that came from God, I think. Popery is just what prophecy declared that she would be. And the apostasy of the latter times. It is a part of her policy to assume the character which will best accomplish her purpose. But beneath the variable appearance of the chameleon, did I say it right, honey? Yeah. <laughs> She conceals the invariable venom of the serpent. Oh, mercy. Turn with me to Revelation 16, 13. Oh, boy. This is back where we started. I saw three unclean spirits like frogs. Come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, now the mouth of the false prophet. Folks, should we quit talking about this stuff? We can't. Not if we are going to live up to what we are told, the commission that we were given by God. What was Christ's last words when he was leaving this earth. Go and make disciples. Are we making disciples? We have an end time message that was saved to our time. God gave it to Daniel. He said, but close up the book because it's for a later time. He gave it to John on the Isle of Patmos. John the Beloved. You put them together and we and God opened it up in our last times and we're going to quit talking about it? We're not going to go tell people from another church to come out? Oh, Lord. Let's pray. Loving Father, we can't quit talking about this. We can't ignore the things that you have given us to tell. I don't care about an agreement that was signed 40 years ago. I don't care about things that are being said today. I don't, be, I don't care your gospel is there. The remnant message is there. Lord, we have to proclaim it as you gave it because you're going to hold us accountable. And that's not why I'm saying this. Lord, I say that we've got to do it because it's our duty as followers of you, because of our love for you. Lord, give us the backbone to stand up and witness for you as the people did in the Middle Ages, as your apostles did. Every one of them died a martyr well, except John, but they tried to kill him. They tried to French fry him, Lord, but you wasn't, you preserved him. But Lord, you promised you'd be with us. Now go with us today, I pray. I pray all of this in your precious name, Lord Jesus. Once again, I thank you, our King and our Redeemer. Amen.